Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you to FPF for inviting me. Um, we all have to make decisions on data. And based on the value of that data, we make a decision. But what if that data is inappropriate? So I would like to talk about areas where we can end up getting values where we base decisions which, where the actual values are questionable. So if you ever go to a, uh, a presentation where you've got the Commission or EFSA, it always starts with a disclaimer. So here, this is mine. I'm not an analyst. I don't do analytical chemistry, but I have to understand the results that come from analytical chemistry. And the work today is embryonic, and it's still growing. More and more associations are joining, and at some point in time, we will invite member states to join. Um, what will come out of it at the end will be different to what we envisage at the beginning. I've been involved in one or two of these initiatives, and they do evolve over time. This presentation is a summation of all of these associations. They're all non-plastics. The strict terminology is non-harmonized EU legislation, but for the simple, it's non-plastics. So this covers the bulk of the food contact materials which are not plastics. Now, what is the problem? Well, in the plastics regulation, the migration guidelines uh, refer to plastics. As we know, 19 of the 20 something food contact materials are not harmonized, not regulated at harmonized EU level. So, what do the authorities do? They apply the rules of plastic. What else can you do? As it so happens, the uh, Belgium resolution, regulation, when it actually becomes a decree, and the Varenvet, when it's issued probably next year, will have the migration conditions in the PIM, but we believe they're inappropriate. And why, why is this? Because if you get higher levels of migration because the simulant time, temperature, or even the simulant used is inappropriate, you can make an inappropriate judgment, either good or bad. You've got to take everything, you've got to look at how that value was obtained for a non-plastic. Now, the num members of the associations have formed a task to offer testing better adapted to the specificity of the different sectors. We've asked the JRC to be involved, and thank goodness they've agreed, and they're very helpful, and they're there as an observer and in the migration guidelines for plastics, I am assured that on page two or three, there is text stating that these guidelines do not apply to non-harmonized food contact materials. It's something we requested a year ago at the member state meeting, and it has been implemented. And as an aside, I don't think the guidelines will be out until sometime next year because the regulation has to be amended before they can publish the guidelines, because there's a clash somehow. Um, so each of the sectors is assessing the applicability, or not, of the 10-2011, which is a plastics regulation, of the guidelines for migration. In many cases, there isn't a problem. But in some cases, there is. And feasibility of implementation and gaps are being identified by each sector and collected and we're trying to put together a guidance document for the non-plastics sector. Now all of the proposals for alternatives are going to be based on technical and scientific justification. We're not going to say we don't want to do it because we don't like it, it's too expensive, we're going to have justification as to why it doesn't work and why we would propose something else. Each of the task force are developing their own compliance guidelines with separate chapters for each 
harmonized, I'm sorry, each non-harmonized food contact material. And I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what it will look like as of today. What it will look like when it's finally published next year, who knows? So there'll be an introduction, and you see here we've got a whole range. Hopefully this works. Nope. There we are. Of, of, of all of the different sectors. And I've just chosen one to show the complexity. We've called it coatings. And all of these sectors are just involved in coatings. Um, FEC, these are involved in equipment. Passivation of coatings on metals. Metal foil. And so you go on and on and on. It is a lot more complex than someone outside of the industry may think, because there's a big overlap. And the each food contact material sector is going to apply a common format for the material-specific guidelines, involving the scope, uses, definitions. And for someone outside of industry, or that sector in industry, definitions are a major issue. There is no accepted definition of a coating today. Um, as some, well, at least one member state member will remember lots of debates at the Council of Europe and the Commission over what is a definition of a coating. What was acceptable for the Council of Europe for their coatings resolution was not acceptable to the Commission because it was not legally binding. We need a reason as to why the plastic testing guidelines are maybe, maybe inappropriate. Test procedures, evaluation of the results, and some annexes. Now, the amount of detail in each sector's chapters will vary considerably. I take two examples. Silicons have an issue mainly specific to bakeware, baking moulds. Adhesives cover all majority of the uh, food contact materials. So the adhesives chapter will be much, much longer than the silicon chapter. What we did find, and not surprising when you think about it retrospectively, is that different sectors had similar problems with some of the simulants, times or temperatures. And we still have debate now as to whether to tackle the subject by substrate or by material. For example, baking paper. You could have it as fluoropolymers, silicones, others. Do you treat it as paper or do you treat it as fluoropolymers, silicones, others? So there's, these debates are still going on. So as I say, this is embryonic. So this is not cast in stone yet. What comes out may be different. So I'd like to show you some examples of um, some of the things we found. 3% acetic acid for overall migration. This was one of the major issues for many sectors. Uh, the first thing is overall migration is not a measure of safety. Even the Commission will agree to that. It is a measure of inertness. Years ago, when we didn't have the analytical techniques that we have now, OM was brought in as a safeguard to make sure that you, it was a catch-all. The issue is that acetic acid corrodes aluminium, either as a coated substrate or a foil layer in a multi-layer. So what do I mean? <coughs> there are two, for the non-people not practicing this every day, this is... I apologize to those that are aware of this, but in English we call it teaching grandmother to suck eggs. True migration is when a substance comes from the lacquer into the simulant. What happens with acetic acid and aluminium is that the acetic acid goes through the layer and actually corrodes the aluminium, forming aluminium triacetate. Now, why does that matter? Because when you do overall migration, you evaporate to dryness. And this increases the weight of the residue. Take aluminium, molecular weight 27. It's corroded form, aluminium triacetate, 204. 
So 87% of the weight could be due to aluminium triacetate. Is that a, can you make a decision on that? Because it's, the, it's not the, anything coming from the film. It's something coming from the substrate, the aluminium. Uh, flexible packaging Europe is one of their biggest issues. And for coatings for metal packaging, it's one of our, it's a major issue. The use of citric acid has been proposed. There is a drawback. To do overall migration, you have to evaporate to dryness. Unfortunately, citric acid is not volatile enough to e evaporate to dryness. So although the Belgium decree will refer to citric acid, we expect, well, we know because we've talked to, to Fabian, etc., that that will be waived in the case of metals because it's not practical. However, we do think we have a solution. Use 3% acetic for the extraction, but then take the chloroform soluble part and weigh the residue from the chloroform uh, extract. It has to be a wet on wet. Doing it wet on dry gives you the incorrect results because you get interference from the matrix. And to confirm this for can coatings, we are going to use, compare the chloroform extract results with stainless steel panels and silver foil where no corrosion can occur. And this is how we're going about validating our proposed alternatives. Now, the next part is to do with baking molds. Um, and this comes from the silicon people. I'm not an expert in this area, so I will present it. Again, this is a compilation of some of the issues. Um, silicons are exempted from the plastics regulation. Uh, and the elastomers have different physiochemical properties compared to plastics. As we've already said, the main issue is with silicon baking molds. The oil, which should be used, penetrates into the elastomer and then gives you an overestimation of the migration. And the same applies for the substitutes of isooctane and 95% ethanol. You have to remove the absorbed oil by soxlet extraction with a nonpolar solvent. This could, I'm not saying it will, but it could easily cause additional extraction of the components from the silicone. And you're skewing the results further from reality. A proposal is to use 10 ax, which does not penetrate the, the elastomer. Under the old directive, 10 ax was acceptable, but there is a lack of clarity about its acceptability under 10 2011. With the new migration guidelines, some of that may be cleared up. But Tenax also overestimates migration compared to normal bakeware. Unless you apply a reduction factor of five. The silicon industry believe the most important criteria to determine the suitability of silicon molds is to limit the volatile substances according to uh, the recommendation 15 the BFR and the French legislation. Meeting the limit for volatiles of less than 0.5%, the majority of the migrants consist of cyclic siloxanes are greater than 1,000 Dalton, which we do not, with today's knowledge, expect to endanger human health. 50% ethanol. Uh, this came out of the Food Migrasure project. Um, some polyester coatings delaminate and swell when tested at 130 for two hours with 50% ethanol. However, when they are tested with food, they do not show any physical changes. For example, milk. 50% ethanol is the milk, sub is the milk simulant. You, test, you look at a coating with milk that's been exposed to milk 
and 50% ethanol, they look completely different. So what's the solution? Well, the legislation says you've got to do it in the food stuff. But how do you do an overall migration where you're evaporating to dryness in milk? Anyone with an answer, I'd be very grateful. <laughs> so one proposal which needs further investigation is either decrease the testing time and or temperature so no physical changes occur to the film or test with 10% ethanol and uh, vegetable oil. That is one alternative. <clears throat> now, as I've said before, we have to make decisions on data. And I've got an example now where we looked at the difference between a simulant and actual food stuff. This is a real example. We needed a coding for medical packaging for foodstuffs with varying degrees of oily characteristics, from vegetables in oil to water oil emulsions. Rather than use the various simulants, we decided to use 95% ethanol. That's the worst case, which legislation says you can do. It was an alternative to oil in 9748. It's not in 10 2011 yet, but I had a brief glimpse of the revised migration guidelines and I think it will reappear in the migration guidelines. It's certainly in the revised Varenvet, which would apply to coatings on metal. And also the customer asked for 95% ethanol, which is always a good reason to do it. So the standard protocol is 95% ethanol, four hours at 60, for sterilization at 120 to 130, and 10 days at 40. The new conditions are 10 days at 60 if you apply the rules for plastics to non-plastics. And these results in 95% ethanol gave us cause for concern. We extract, rather than do an overall migration, we decided to look at a monomer. And we compared it to the, the level in actual food. Now, in this particular instance, the food stuff only had this coating around it. Had there's no other, it was unusual. Normally, in can coatings, you have you can have five or six different coatings in a package. In this case, it was just that one coating. So we know that it's only that coating contributing that monomer. And we compared it into extraction into acetonitrile, which certainly for the last 20 years has been the industry standard, uh, and also hexane acetone. And they were around the 10-ish, 10, 10, 10 to 15 micrograms per decimeter squared. The food stuff we looked at was industrially processed and stored for six to more than 12 months. So it was sterilized and processed. Four different batches of coating and packaging were used. So we were very fortunate that the customer had actually kept samples because we were looking at new chemistries. And if I actually apply the real surface area to volume ratios approximately, we can gather comparison. The food stuff was less than 70 ppb. We could have gone lower, but I stopped the lab doing it. But I said, look, it's good enough to prove the point. There's matrix interference. We could have gone right down. We look at, look at the extraction into ethanol. 740, 740, 772, 788, 636. If I'd used the conditions for plastics, I would have made decisions on these numbers. And in fact, this, the product is perfectly uh, compliant. I use the word compliant because the word safe, what is safe, is, a, is, another, is another question. So <coughs> you need to think about the numbers you get. How did you get them? What do they mean? Um, yeah, it's clear that hydrolysis may be occurring in 95% ethanol. 
but it's not in the presence of the foodstuff. You could make a conclusion about the safety of the coating using this extraction data, and it would give rise to arguably unnecessary concerns about its safety. So be careful when treating data for non-harmonized food contact materials because there are issues with some of the simulants. And I'd just like to acknowledge the, the task force and some of the people that gave me uh, some of the, some of the slides for the presentation. And thank you for your attention.